uh, kia ora koto, uh, uh, na mihi nui to the conference conveners and attendees, and na mihi nui to my uh, workmates within the digital directorate here at Te Papa, and uh, workmates across Te Papa, and na mihi nui to all the companies and individuals have been uh, who have been involved in the work uh, that I'm pre presenting today. Um, a, a number of uh, of, of whom are here today. So really great to, to see you. Um, welcome. And uh, uh, I'm Amos Mann, a digital pr producer here at Te Papa. And this is a story about data. And it begins in a bug lab. The bug lab exhibition was created by Te Papa, working closely with Weta Workshop, uh, with Richard Taylor as creative director. Um, so far, in its 10-plus year touring life cycle, it has completed two very successful runs. It opened at Te Papa in December, and it recently finished its run at Melbourne Museum. Uh, this was the first exhibition in which Te Papa used digital labels alone to provide information about the specimens and objects on display, and it was also the first time Te Papa built visitor activity data collection into almost all of the digital products within the exhibition. Uh, I should also mention that I am by no means an expert in data analysis. <laughs> However, I do have a large amount of experience um, of the gallery context for um, the, in which this data collection took place. And as a digital producer, as the digital producer on the exhibition, I find myself in the best, uh, you know, I find myself best place to, to present the work which has been undertaken by many, many people over the past year. So why collect data? And we can look to one of the winning aspirations of to Papa's digital directorate for an answer, to put audiences and their needs at the heart of digital innovation and use insights to continuously improve experiences. More broadly, I've come up with these five goal categories. Uh, personally, I'm most interested in the last one. Um, how might we use data collection and analysis in creative ways? Data is being used across all these categories in increasingly sophisticated ways within the context of websites and software applications installed on single user personal devices. However, there are challenges we need to overcome if we want to apply these uh, web and app data practices to the gallery context. And I believe um, that where there are challenges, there are also opportunities. <laughs> uh, opportunities to take new, a new and creative approach. Here are some of the main reasons why there are challenges. Um, but put simply, data collection in gallery is different to the web because we usually aren't talking about single user sessions on personal devices. But instead, we're usually talking about multi-user sessions on public devices. And these are, these are physicalized experiences. They are fixed within a spatial design. And we are therefore uh, positioning these experiences within a, a physical user journey, which can, can be seen as quite different to a browser-based user journey. The Bug Lab exhibition has 15 digital labels integrated into lab tables throughout the exhibition. And the uh, concept that I was working with uh, for these was that the, uh, the labels would act as control panels um, for the apparatus um, in which the specimens and objects um, were under investigation. And there are three different types of labels, each with a different user interface structure and different information architecture. The specimen label UI involves a photographic representation of the specimen display the label relates to. The user taps a bug to reveal its label content. The object label type has a simple three-step content structure, um, sort of like a, a storybook, um, and it begins with a provocative prompt. And this is the details label where visitors tap on a point of interest. And here's an example of a data log generated through visitor use. I should point out that uh, we needed to build a custom event logger for these interactives rather than using something like Google Analytics. And this is because partly we, partly because we were restricted in the hardware we could use for the touring show. We built these as, as HTML 
interactives running on Brightsign media players. And this was also a first uh, for Te Papa um, using HTML within the Brightsign um, machines. Um, we worked closely with Toulouse um, to do the build on these projects, and we worked with ClickSuite uh, to uh, uh, on the um, design and uh, UX research and user experience. So the activity that you see in that log took place over four minutes and 15 seconds. At a glance, you might notice that um, there's an inactivity home return event at the end of the series that I've selected. But I suspect that we are seeing more than one session represented here because of the time length which is over three times the mean observed session length for the labels. And because about halfway through, there's a 15 second gap, and then there's a change in behavior, see if you can spot it. Suddenly, there's a lot of image swiping. And I reckon we're seeing two different visitors using the interactive uh, consecutively here. As I've alluded to, uh, analysis of gallery log files has been less than straightforward um, and or, or less straightforward than anticipated. Um, for example, we don't have a good way to detect those as two distinct sessions through automated analysis. However, some results have emerged through a number of different approaches we've taken to analysis. Here are some results from analysis that we undertook with the company D-Exhibit, uh, showing average daily sessions for one uh, of the specimen labels. And the Atlas Moth is the winner. <laughs> However, it's also the biggest insect on the screen. The least popular is the housefly, which is also the smallest specimen on the screen. The popularity slash size pattern holds true for the first three or four of the largest bugs, but then the scarab beetle breaks the trend, gaining higher than average sessions per day than the larger puriri moth. Is this a sign that the scarab beetle is punching above its weight? Should we display more scarab beetles? Would we ever replace the puriri moth with more scarab beetles? Maybe we would. Or instead, we might look to break with the strict adherence to representing bugs at their relative size. Instead, we might present them in a way that's more relevant to the science stories we're trying to tell. Um, so here's another example of a potentially useful insight. Across all the object labels, this, this data is not, is applied, uh, it's, it's a mean av or averages um, from, um, average daily sessions across all the, uh, the object type labels. And we can see that more users ended their session on page three than any other page. And that page three was the last page, or I should tell you, page three was the last page of content in a step through content structure. So we believe that this is an indicator that we have about the right amount of content uh, for the object label um, information architecture. Although care must be taken, results like this look all too familiar. They look like website user data. And we mustn't forget that web context is really quite different to gallery context. We need to ask how many people were interacting together as a group to generate this data? How many people were using the interactive in quick succession, beginning their session on a page other than the home page? And how many people just kept lovingly tapping the scarab beetle 20 times in a row? We can't answer these questions uh, through simple analysis of activity data alone. To answer these questions, we need to combine, we need to combine activity data with other data sets. Here um, are some of the standard measures uh, for websites. Of those, when dealing with in-gallery context, these are the ones that we can measure using activity data alone, and not very accurately. <laughs> However, we can ask, is there a parallel version of these measures? Can we come up with some new definitions um, that work in parallel for the in-gallery context? Yes, but we need to combine user activity data with other data sets to make these measures. For example, we ran observational sessions within BugLab and gained session length data 
and number of visitors per session data. Um, and from this, um, uh, and this is data that we can't get from the, the event logs. Um, and we can, so we can use these uh, figures gained from observation to extrapolate insights from the event log data in order to gain a measure of how many people are using the labels, which is probably a good question uh, that we should be asking. So come and see me after the presentation if you want to know about the method I used to, or I, I developed to, to do that extrapolation. It's a little bit, um, it's just a little bit boring. <laughs> So here's a good example of combining data sets. Um, this is time and use data from another type of interactive in the bug lab, not a label. It's called wings in motion. So the orange line shows weekly exhibition visitor numbers. And the bars are the amount of time the interactive was being used as a percentage of opening hours. And we can see something kind of interesting here. We can see a drop in visitor numbers across weeks four, five, and six, that, that orange line starts to drop from its peak. And yet, time in use remains up around 60% and doesn't drop until the seventh week. This might be an indicator that across our busiest period, 26 December to 22nd Jan, visitor numbers were above a threshold where higher visitor numbers did not result in higher time in use for that interactive. In other words, this points to a measure of the maximum capacity time in use for this interactive. And I think it's safe to say that it's about 60% of opening hours per week. Uh, we could go into a finer grain analysis over that and get um, a little bit more of a bell curve over each day or over a week that's busier on weekends, but averaged over a week, 60% of opening hours, it is in use, somebody is using it. When numbers are above wherever that drop sits to in the seventh week. And when you think about context and how many, uh, and, and this bulking of visitor numbers that I've been talking about in the middle of, uh, of the day or at the weekend, well, 60% um, opening hours per week seems to be a pretty good capacity benchmark. And I wouldn't be surprised if similar time and use capacity benchmarks were discovered for interactives of a similar nature in a similar location in the gallery and a similar style of exhibition in Wellington in New Zealand. <laughs> a big caveat there. <laughs> uh, when we see an indicator like this, uh, what can we do about it? Well, we could increase the number of copies of the interactive, uh, thereby doubling the capacity. Um, we could increase the visitor throughput by removing the least popular content and thereby streamlining the, the experience while maintaining satisfaction. And uh, we, for this one, actually, we did spot um, a particular moth that really was not getting much attention at all. <laughs> uh, so get rid of the moth. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, uh, and then... But here, and I think most importantly, I suspect that moving the interactive into a more prominent location might also bump up capacity. Um, at Te Papa, it was positioned a little bit out of the way. Um, if you, 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 there wasn't other things next to it. Um, if you, you could imagine people taking a bit, noticing it's free, and then taking a bit of time to walk over there and then start using it, and that. And so if it was more placed in a, in a more uh, prominent location, I think we would get higher uh, capacity. In fact, I would argue that the single greatest influence on the reach or conversion rate of a fixed location digital product within an exhibition is its spatial positioning within the gallery. Or to put it another way, um, yes, it is a bit of a truism. <laughs> <laughs> However, I do like this statement because it speaks to the difference between exhibition context and online context really clearly. The success of a website is not considered to have any connection to the spatial location of the user in relation to their personal device. No, the reason your website is doing badly isn't because users can't quite reach their phone. But as you can see from this diagram, for an accurate measure of the reach or conversion rate for an interactive, we really need to know how many visitors came close enough to have the opportunity to engage with the product before we can start to measure uh, conversion in a meaningful way. 
Um, it would also be good to know how many of them glanced over at the kiosk and maybe even went up to it and decided not to engage, which is a behavior that we can define as bounce. By combining these data sets, we can start to come up with an in-gallery definition of bounce rate and a definition of reach or conversion rate. And we would need this kind of data to measure the impact of spatial positioning of a product within the gallery. So what if we did move it? Well, how would we know that this, or how would we know that's a good position compared to another? Yeah. It's a dynamic scenario, as, as, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, to get this data, you could uh, sit, and, and I'm talking about catchment zone data there. To get that data, you could sit and watch and see how many people come within the catchment zone for your interactive, which we've done. We have done that. Um, or you could use another form of automated data collection. During the last week of the exhibition at Te Papa, the Mahuki team, Breadcrumb, installed their centimetre accurate positioning technology throughout the, throughout the gallery. And at the ticket desk, they signed up 167 visitors and gave them a trackable tag to wear during their visit. Visitors were actually very keen to take part in the tracking and very happy to answer um, uh, survey questions at the end of their visit also. So it's so a really, very really valuable uh, data set. Here, here is the high accuracy walking path for those 167 visitors. These technologies can be used to analyze the success of the layout of experiences in relation to wider user journey, journeys, and also to calculate things like um, bounce rate and um, conversion rate, which are pretty simple things for the web, but yeah. This is the dwell time heat map view of that same data. There have been some really fascinating hints at areas for further research that have emerged uh, from this study, um, but on a more funda fundamental uh, on a more fundamental level, if we want that same level of accuracy and granularity that we get from websites and apps within a spatialized user journey, we need spatialized data. So far in this presentation, we've been looking at ways we might use visitor activity data to reach the first four types of goal categories that I introduced at the beginning. However, I believe the most interesting future potential is to use visitor data in creative ways, um, in ways that create transformative experiences, in ways that empower our visitors and communities. There are many kinds of data feedback loops commonly seen on platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, Netflix. Do they translate into the gallery? We've seen a number of museums provide visitors with their own personal visit data, such as Cooper Hewitt and Mona. And this, maybe this is acting like a souvenir or a memento. Um, is the data generated from our collective experience in, in a gallery also of interest? Museum workers find this kind of data fascinating. Um, I take that as a sign that our visitors might find it to be of great value also. Um, they might even find that it is empowering and inspiring to consider this collective visitor data in relationship with specimens, objects, stories, and experiences in gallery. Discussion on this has arisen over the last few months with another Mahuki team, uh, Continuex. Continuex have been looking at what could be discovered by combining some of the data sources we have. Um, they are working on a product called Morph that, as I qu and I'm quoting here, that uses artificial intelligence tools to generate real-time visitor insights and predictions. Morph's customers can use these insights and predictions to deliver tailored experiences. Uh, tailored exhibitions, targeted offers, and personalized visitor experiences. And we've been talking with Continuex to look at how we might combine data sets such as location data and interactive event data to create new and dynamic experiences for visitors. Application of machine learning and artificial intelligence has the potential to take this creative thinking into a future where visitors build a dynamic and responsive lifelong relationship with the museum and its collections and stories um, through, th through this technology. In preparation for this talk, um, I discussed some of these AI and machine learning potentials with my colleagues uh, Kate Wanless and, and Richard Hulse. Um, Kate uh, is a UX researcher and Richard is a product owner for the um, digital experience delivery system, and we felt 
that we could more easily accept a recommendation provided by AI than we could a decision made by AI on our behalf. Um, a decision kind of started to feel a bit creepy. But hang on, isn't a recommendation actually a kind of decision made on our behalf? Just as we encounter these issues online, we can easily imagine all kinds of dystopian decisions made for us in the gallery, and we might be reminded of, uh, in an extreme case, Hal from 2001. I wonder what Hal might decide is the best uh, thing for me during my in-gallery experience. I might ask, why did the museum recommend that painting for me? Is it because I'm Jewish? Is it because I'm male? Is it because I'm 45? Uh, am I being privileged? Am I being excluded? Um, we might never know why Museum AI made a recommendation. AI and machine learning tools often operate as a black box, too complex uh, for a human to unpack. It's probably too late to just say no to AI, but I believe that it's not too late for the glamour sector to ask, what is our version of the infamously abandoned motto, don't be evil, uh, in relation to how we use these kinds of data sets in creative ways in gallery? And by meeting these ethical challenges, I believe we will see even greater creative opportunities. AI personas such as Alexa or Siri are becoming more and more prevalent, um, but I believe that in the transfer of this technology from the home and the personal into the public gallery, we will likely face very similar challenges to those that we've encountered over the past year when taking the first steps towards transferring data practice from the web, or data analytics practice from the web into gallery context. When working with Richard Taylor on developing Bug Lab, one of the key questions he would ask as creative director was, what is the conceit of the exhibition? The creative result of this line of questioning was an exhibition with a sense of make-believe that it was built by bugs. What role could AI take in realizing this creative approach more fully? In this data-driven AI version of an exhibition built by bugs, maybe the exhibition personas can listen to you and respond to what you want to tell them, and maybe they can work and play with you towards a much, much deeper transformative understanding and connection with the world of bugs. And I'd like to say great thanks, uh, na mihi nui, to, to everyone involved with input to this uh, data discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>